Welcome back. We're here for part two for chapter two on probability. Uh, the topics in this screencast will be from section two four and two five regarding the probability of event and some rules for probability. So we'll start with axioms of probability for a discrete sample space S. The first is that for any A which is a subset of S, the probability of A is going to be non-negative, meaning we should never compute a probability and get a negative number. The second axiom is that the probability of S occurring is equal to 1. The third axiom states that if we have A1, A2, A3, and so on, which are a finite or infinite sequence of mutually exclusive events of S, then the probability of their union is equal to the sum of their individual probabilities. And again, this only works provided those events are all mutually exclusive, meaning they don't share any common outcomes or elements. So let's look at a little example. Suppose we roll a six-sided die and we'll define two events, the first being A, that the number that comes up on the die is even, and B, the event that the number that comes up on the die is less than two. And it's worth noting that these two events are disjoint, right? It's not possible to have um, an even number or a number that's less than two simultaneously. To start, let's consider the probability of A union B that is the event that the number on the die is even or that it's a number less than two. So there are three even numbers, two, four, and six, and there's only one number less than two, that's one. So that's a total of four outcomes out of the six possible when we roll a six-sided die. So that's the probability of A union B, making use of the strategies from the previous sections. Um, but now let's think of it in terms of the individual probabilities of events A and B. The probability of event A will be 3 out of 6 because there's 3 even numbers out of 6. And the probability of B is 1 out of 6 because there's only one number that's less than 2. If we add those individual probabilities, we do get 4 out of 6, which is the same as what we have here for the probability of A union B. And this here is an example of axiom number 3 from above. All right, next we're going to return to that notion of our probability being defined classically. This time we'll be stating it as theorem 2.2 to show that that classical interpretation is consistent with our axioms. So in particular, if an experiment can result in any one of n different equally likely outcomes, and if k of these outcomes together constitute event a, then the probability of a is equal to k over n. So let's prove this. We'll start with S, remember S is our sample space, and if our experiment can result in any one of n different equally likely outcomes, then we'll say that those outcomes can be labeled O1, O2, O3, and so on out to On for those n different outcomes. And since those outcomes are each equally likely to occur, then the probability of any individual outcome is just going to be 1 over capital N for each of those outcomes, 1 through n. Since A is an event that consists of K of the outcomes together, then we can write A as the union of those K outcomes. We'll call them O1, union O2, union, and so on, down to O sub K. <clears throat> so by definition, the probability of A is the probability of the union of those K events, and since each of those K events, or since those K events are mutually exclusive, then by the third axiom for probability, we can say that that probability of the union is equal to the, prob the sum of the individual probabilities of those events, each of which is equal to 1 over n. So we're adding 1 over n to itself k times here, so the overall probability of A occurring is equal to k over n. This thereby proves that the classical definition of probability that we discussed in the previous sections is consistent with these axioms that we're going to be working from. So now let's look at another rule of probability. Let's consider two complementary events, A and its complement. These are events in S, and if that's the case, then the probability of A complement is equal to 1 minus the probability of A. Or in other words, the sum of the individual probabilities of two complementary events should equal 1. So let's prove this. Since A and A complement are events in S, and by definition they are complementary, then their union should equal S, and we know the probability of S occurring is equal to 1 from our second axiom, 
Therefore, since 1 is equal to the probability of S, and S can be written as the union of A and A complement, then the probability of A union A complement should equal 1. But by the third axiom, since these are mutually exclusive events, A and its complement do not share any common elements, then this should also equal the sum of their individual probabilities by the third axiom. And therefore, we get that the probability of A and it plus the probability of its complement is equal to 1. And we can solve that expression for the probability of the complement to get 1 minus the probability of A. We get another <clears throat> theorem. This is theorem 2.4, which would say that for any sample space S, the probability of the empty set is equal to 0. You might be able to see this from the fact that the empty set would be the complement of S. And since the probability of S is equal to 1, then 1 minus the probability of S would give us the probability of the empty set, which is 0. A couple more theorems. The first is theorem 2.5. If we have two events in S, column A and B, and if A is a subset of B, then the probability of A should be less than or equal to the probability of B. And you might be able to see this by looking at a Venn diagram to sort of help that. I've got my rectangle, which represents the sample space. I've got event B. Event A is a subset, so it's contained entirely in B. So when we look at the probability of A, it should be less than or equal to the probability of B. We're not going to prove that right now. We move on to theorem 2.6, which says for any event A and S, the probability of A occurring has to be a number between 0 and 1 inclusive. And that should seem reasonable. It sort of follows from the first axiom and the second axiom coupled with theorem 2.5. The first axiom, remember, told us that the probability of any event was greater than or equal to 0. The second axiom told us that the probability of S occurring was equal to 1. And since A is a subset of S, the probability of A should be less than the probability of S, which gives us this probability of A being less than or equal to 1. All right, and another theorem, this will be theorem 2.7, which we'll call the general addition rule. This says if we have two events in S, A, and B, then the probability of their union is equal to the sum of the individual probabilities minus the probability of their intersection. <clears throat> so <clears throat> earlier in this little screencast, we discussed how the probability of the union of some events was equal to the sum of probabilities, but the thing to be careful about was those were mutually exclusive events, and here, we're not stating that A and B are necessarily mutually exclusive. If they were mutually exclusive, then the probability of their intersection would be zero, and this term would go away, and we'd have something equivalent to what was stated in the axiom. But now, we're not saying that A and B are mutually exclusive. So let's prove this with a Venn diagram. So we're going to take this Venn diagram again. The box represents the sample space. We've got our two events, A and B. And these lowercase letters, A, C, B, and D, are going to correspond to probabilities for each of these regions. So then the probability of event A occurring should be the sum of these two probabilities, A and C. The probability of event B occurring is the sum of the two probabilities, little c and little b. And the probability of A union B is the sum of these three values, A plus B plus C. <clears throat> so that corresponds to the value of what would be on the left-hand side of the equation in the conclusion of the theorem above. So now if we consider the probability of A plus the probability of B plus or minus the probability of A intersected with B, that's the right-hand side of this equation, probability of A is the A plus C. The probability of B is this C plus B. And then their intersection is has a probability of C and if we add that to or subtract that rather from the previous parts of the sum those C's will cancel and we'll end up with a result of A plus C plus B and that gives us the prob same value as the probability of A union B thereby proving by Venn diagram that uh, this equivalency up above is true. So let's move on to some examples that allow us to apply these probability rules. And this particular example comes from working with a standard deck of 52 cards. We're going to randomly select one card, and we're going to define two events as follow. The first event is going to be B. The card is black. So that could be a card that comes up with something, any kind of spade or any kind of club. And F is the event that the card is a face card. And for our purposes, that will correspond to the card being a jack, a queen, or a king. 
So the first question is, what's the probability that the randomly selected card is a black face card? So this is really asking us, what's the probability that the card we select is both black and a face card? And if we think about that, there are two suits that are black, spades and clubs. Each of them has three face cards, so there's a total of six face cards that are black out of the 50 cards of the deck. So the probability of B intersected with F is 6 over 52, because intersection means both black and a face card simultaneously. Now well, let's move on to the second example. What is the probability that the randomly selected card is black or a face card? So now we want the probability of B union F, so we're going to use that generalized addition rule from the previous slide. The probability of B union F is the probability of B plus the probability of F minus the probability of the intersection of those two events. So why should that make sense? Well, think about it. How many black cards are there? Well, there's 26 black cards out of 52. How many face cards are there? Well, there are 12 face cards out of the 52. But when we're counting these 12 face cards, we're counting the jack, queen, and king of spades and clubs, but those values were those cards were also counted in this previous 26. So we have to subtract 6, which is the intersection of our two events, the 6 out of 52, to account for the fact that we've double counted the black face cards in the, the sum of these two initial values. So our total is then 32 out of 52. That's our probability that the randomly selected card is either a black or a face card, or potentially both. Lastly, what is the probability that a randomly selected card is not a face card? So now we're looking for the complement of the event F, because F is the card is a face card. We want non-face cards, so that means we're looking for the probability of F complement. So we can use that complement rule, which allows us to do 1 minus the probability of F. And the probability of F, remember, is 12 out of 52 because there's 12 face cards out of the 52 card deck. And we subtract that from 1 to get 39 out of 52. This concludes our discussion of some rules of probability. Thank you.